Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this panel discussion. Uh, it's an area that I'm delighted to talk a little about, uh, in part because this is a break from having to struggle with all of the regulators that I'm going to denounce in the next 45 minutes. Uh, so it's a bit cathartic. Um, uh, my name is John Coriel. I'm a partner at Cobra and Kim. Uh, we are a firm that handles only disputes and investigations, uh, and largely in disputes involving financial products and services. Uh, it brings us frequently into contact with the SEC, but also the Justice Department, the CFTC, and the alphabet soup of uh, financial products and service regulators, especially after Dodd-Frank, that have been charged with what seem like, to us at least, an increasingly uh, burdensome uh, and uh, an interesting fleet of federal regulations. Uh, before uh, I was at this firm, I was an assistant United States attorney in the Economic Crimes Unit uh, here in the Southern District of Florida, where I uh, prosecuted a wide variety of uh, financial uh, wrongdoing uh, from Ponzi schemes and uh, general frauds to Medicare fraud um, and also um, you know less um, financial crimes uh, like human trafficking, migrant smuggling, immigration offenses, firearm offenses. Uh, prior to that I was at Davis Polk and Wardwell for five years in New York uh, and I began my career clerking in Washington for uh, a judge who, in addition to being a great uh, federal district court judge, was also for a time the chief judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, and my uh, clerkship was in 2003, so that's about all I can say about my clerkship. Uh, but it was a, a lot of fun. Uh, and now I have the, uh, the great pleasure of practicing uh, here in South Florida, which I hope some of you, show of hands, who's visiting from outside South Florida? Just about everyone in the room. So I, I, uh, I hope everyone gets a chance not just to enjoy everything that South Beach has to offer. Don't worry, I still have plenty of friends at the US Attorney's Office if you enjoy them too much. Um, I'll hand out my business card. Um, but uh, there are other things across the causeway which I encourage you to go have a taste of. Go to Wynwood, see the uh, sort of thriving arts district, come downtown and, and see what's going on at Brickell City Center. It's a, it's a city that's very much changing and evolving uh, and it's a, a real treat to have you here. Jacob. Thank you, and I'm Jacob Frankel. Uh, today I am a partner at Shulman Rogers. I say that because come Monday I'll be a partner at the law firm Dickinson Wright after 11 and a half years at, uh, at Shulman Rogers. My practice is at, at Shulman Rogers and at Dickinson, where I will. Um, I chair the firm's securities enforcement, white collar criminal, and government investigations practices. My background in brief is I, was, I started my career as an assistant district attorney in New Orleans, so as a street crimes prosecutor. Spent 10 years with the SEC's Enforcement Division in Washington, was a federal prosecutor, public corruption and securities, and spent the last 17 years on the defense side, focused most heavily on SEC enforcement, but also, as I indicate, internal investigations and general white collar. I too am pleased to be here uh, to be with you, and uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share the stage with, uh, with John. So, with no further ado, I think we'll get into some substance for you. Okay. And ask us questions along the way. Yeah, we hope, we hope, as every panelist ever s said in the history of paneldom, uh, we, we hope that the discussion is as interactive as possible, by which I mean interrupt us if you have questions. Don't, don't wait for the end, uh, because we do hope, especially with, with a relatively small group like this, we have a, a good conversation about some stuff that I think is actually quite interesting. Um, so for starters, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that um, there are a host of government actors new tools, new priorities after Dodd-Frank that just weren't part of the scene when I was a federal prosecutor just four years ago. Um, there really has been a sea change um, in the wake of Dodd-Frank to define what can be prosecuted or regulated and who should be doing it. And one of the issues that I think we'll cover today is uh, both the cooperation and competition among regulators to stake out turf about who gets to collect what type of fine after Dodd-Frank. Whether it's the CFTC versus SEC versus CFPB, which is a new financial regulator, versus the good old-fashioned Justice Department. Um, one thing that I think both Jacob and I will talk about is how different regulators interact. And that's the sort of competitive side. There's also a rise in cooperation. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that anybody who practices in a cross-border way uh, the defense of government enforcement will tell you that these days you're much more likely to see 
the Brazilian authorities sharing information with the U.S. authorities, the Argentine authorities post Kirshner sharing information with the U.S. authorities, which means that if you're uh, a defendant or if you're under investigation today as opposed to even four years ago, you have a much more complicated uh, field of government tools and, and, and targets to, to worry about. Um, we'll talk about some of the specific uh, practices that are under scrutiny, some of them now for the very first time. Trading practices that either, either didn't exist or weren't regulated as, as short as five years ago. Things like spoofing, um, very, very high speed algorithmic trading. Uh, these are now areas that regulators uh, sort of look at, if you will, as sources of funding for themselves because they, they see the, the titanic fees and fines. Uh, that they can uh, extract from banks and others who are in these sort of more esoteric spaces. And because there isn't a tradition of who's going to handle it. It's not a situation where there's 30 years of history, like, for example, mafia prosecution. Uh, you know, the Eastern District of New York has cornered the market on a lot of mafia prosecution, notwithstanding the fact that the Southern District of New York did a 120-person takedown, you know, like two weeks ago. It's one of those areas where you just expect that regulator to lead the charge. A lot of this is just not written, and so as a consequence, you've got them jockeying for power about who's going to find this practice out at City, at Wells, at, at Goldman, and extract the big fine, and then be able to turn to the Treasury Department and say, see, the CFTC got this money, or DOJ got this money, or SEC got this money. It's a fascinating environment. Um, we'll look at a couple mar market rigging case studies. A couple of them are actually happening in real time. Um, Two of, of my partners who are supposed to be at this conference are actually in a uh, preliminary injunction hearing on a spoofing case in Chicago. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll conclude with just some practical guidance, none of which I think is surprising, but I, I think will, all, will be helpful for anybody in the room who advises clients uh, who may someday be in trouble uh, for any of these concerns. Okay, so let's talk about who's at the table. Um, much ink has been spilled uh, you know, over the past few years about how far Dodd-Frank goes uh, and, and other uh, sort of new applications of existing law go uh, to make illegal what may not have been illegal or at the very least might not have been prosecuted. Uh, and uh, I, I think in part that's because of 2008, in part because of a reaction to the financial crisis. Uh, sort of a, a yawning divide in the American public opinion between how horrible the financial crisis was for American taxpayers and families and how few people were punished for it. And I think there's this, uh, it, it's, it's something that's been baked into our political discourse, our cultural discourse, um, but it's also sort of, I think, uh, this, this sort of uh, legal uh, consequence of Dodd-Frank, this idea that in the wake of 2007, 2008, it shouldn't be the case that SEC, CFTC, the Justice Department be perceived as asleep at the switch the next time there is some sort of bubble burst, the next time some trading practice causes a, a, down, a, a, you know, a, a, a down market or a 50% loss in the S&P 500 or something like that. Um, and I think that a, a consequence of that is you're seeing the regulators really start to pile on in terms of um, you know, monetary penalties that are assessed. And I think all, all of these things, the CFTC uh, in, in, in Forex trading, uh, you know, the SEC uh, you know, in, in some more classic you know, exchange-listed trading cases as precursors to criminal enforcement, to DOJ getting involved and in actually putting people in jail uh, for some of these practices. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the government climate, if you will. And these are some of the actors. And why don't we start at the beginning? Even before we, get to the act, even before we get to the actors, I think two other real quick points with respect to criminalization. And that is, the, keep in mind that in the U.S., all, almost, well, all federal agencies are accountable to the United States Congress. So, if, so you, you have the United States Congress inquiring of the agencies, what is your performance level? And that's often now being measured, not just in terms of number of cases, but also in dollars. The other thing is, what the, I think what the SEC really has done in particular in sort of distorting the perception and the process is by extracting larger and larger fines from institutions, what, what has happened is other agencies, not just the Department of Justice, have recognized that is something that is very doable in the process of bringing enforcement actions. 
So the, you know, and the, the other point, the other point that I want to make, I think, you, I think John, you alluded to this, is that, for example, in the SEC world, the statistic now, I mean, when I was on staff at the SEC, to, for there to be a parallel SEC Department of Justice investigation was virtually non-existent. I mean, the fact that I, when I was there, I was able to persuade the U.S. Attorney's Office in Salt Lake City to bring a case was an exception. You pretty much had four or five offices around the country that occasionally would bring a case, and most of those were insider trading that they charged not as insider trading, but they charged as mail or wire fraud. Now, particularly post, you know, really post Enron, there's been a popularization and comfort level across U.S. Attorney's offices, offices to bring cases involving corporate fraud. And you really see that ac across the board. As a result, particularly, for example, in the SEC world, the statistic now is that 50% of all SEC investigations have a parallel criminal investigation. So for those of you who are lawyers in the room, or even if you're not a lawyer, but deal in compliance, it really uh, requires an analysis that goes beyond just which is the agency that is calling and, and asking for information. The entire analysis really has changed based on the number of not just U.S. domestic, but also non-U.S. Uh, agencies and ministries that may take interest in a particular set of facts. How many lawyers do we have in the room? Is it largely a legal crowd? Anyone, yeah. anyone currently dealing with more than one regulator for a single client? Yes. Yeah, I, I, and, and is, it, is it two U.S. or is it a little bit of international? One of the I, one of the most frustrating things I've found in in this area is every single one of those um, agencies listed there has a different policy about what they'll tell you if your client is a target or a witness, and so you'll find that you suspect that. Uh, you know, the SEC or CFTC is, is watching you, uh, is gathering information in order to sue you. Uh, and then the next thing you know, it happens, uh, and they're not going to tell you what their expectations are. They're not going to tell you, you know, what the next move is. They just sort of move. Whereas traditionally, at least, the, the Justice Department will tell you, you know, yes, you're a, you're a target, you're a subject, you're a witness. Dumb prosecutors like me like those little Cab, you know, like those little cabinets and are used to being able to stick somebody in them. Uh, but CFTC won't tell you that. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to note here is that um, the state regulators get overlooked frequently um, by non-U.S. audiences, and they can really spoil your day. Um, they, they are um, active because they, too, uh, smell the blood in the water. So the New York AG's office, for example, um, has a very robust financial crimes prosecution unit and you could think to yourself, well, gee, I mean, um, you know, I've got an SEC subpoena that I'm answering. My, my, you know, John is telling me I have to worry about the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in Miami. He's telling me that the New York uh, U.S. Attorney's Office may try to indict the case from, from underneath the Miami office to try and compete with the Miami office, within DOJ. And now you're telling me that the New York AG's office is interested? And the unfortunate answer is yes. And just one, one, one other thought with respect to that, and that is that, well, and, and I, I'm going to use this word very cautiously. While we often think, for example, of the Department of Justice, SEC, CFTC, federal agency investigations as being principled in the sense that there is a, that you almost can attribute a rational reason for their being involved, that they really believe that there's a violation of law, whether it be a, a civil violation or a criminal violation. The states are not that way. The states are almost like a like a, like a championship wrestling, where there's an opportunity to pile on. They want to pile on. Why? Because they are dependent on their fines for funding, and the states are heavily underfunded. I have a matter right now involving a state where there is absolutely no basis for the state to be investigating. That, and even if there were, it would be the kind of matter for which a regulated entity over which it questions to whether it has jurisdiction, you know, maybe would pay a few dollars just to make the thing go away without admitting or denying the allegations. Because the, the company is owned by a foreign entity that is a deep pocket, the demand is a million dollars. And they're, and they're threatening an action without any investigation. So we've actually tried through litigation 
to prevent them from bringing an action proactively. And we can talk about proactive steps later. So the states can, really can be a, uh, a, a loose cannon in this process. And probably the, one of the best examples is an old example, which is WorldCom. Many of you in this room are too young to remember. For those of you who remember sort of Enron, WorldCom, uh, and, and those cases, in WorldCom, you had Department of Justice, SEC, and the New York Attorney General's Office. The delay in the WorldCom settlement was the Attorney General from Oklahoma wanted a seat at the table. And absent that seat at the table, absent the opportunity you know, to, to get into the settlement up front, he was going to come in and bring a case immediately behind all the other regulators. So they really can influence the process. Yeah, and part of this is a consequence of federalism, right? I mean, the US lawyers in the room you know, will know and be familiar with this concept that our state and federal authorities have concurrent jurisdiction over the same wrongs. So a lot of crimes that are federal crimes are also state crimes. And the idea is that you know each prosecutor exercising her discretion about what she'll prosecute and won't prosecute and leave to her colleagues in other jurisdictions will prioritize things correctly, um, or at least in a way that's just. Um, another way in which this, this conflict arises is just with new law. Um, so the CFTC is probably the, the best example of an agency that is sort of uh, reaching uh, a, a new degree of, of uh, enforcement ag aggressiveness after Dodd-Frank. Um, you know, it, it views itself um, as uh, policing uh, the markets, some of which are very poorly understood by the investing public, uh, where um, trading practices that they deem to give an upper hand to extremely powerful, extremely elite traders um, are, are within their sort of reach after Dodd-Frank. I found the, the bottom comment there by Eitan Goldman, who's the, the excellent, he's a former federal prosecutor, he's the excellent uh, head of enforcement at CFTC. He says, you know, there's no substitute for putting actual human beings in jail. What's fascinating about that is that the CFTC cannot put anyone in jail. They are not a criminal regulator. And I think it, it is this sort of culture of federal prosecutors, former federal prosecutors, going to these regulatory authorities that don't have the power to put people in jail as sort of like an effort to beef up their, their bona fides as, as aggressive regulators. Jacob, I don't know if you yeah. want to make a comment about the SEC here, but I'm going to decline so, to do so. Certainly. <laughs> and actually, this goes to Peter's question, Peter's question earlier. And I've made a lot of comments over the years in, you know, in the media and at conferences because it really does tie to this, to this point. And that is that you know, if you listen to SEC speeches, this is going back to when Mary Shapiro was chair of the SEC, you know, and Rob Kazami, who was an assistant U.S. attorney in, you know, in, in New York, uh, was the director of enforcement. That's when the lexicon began about the SEC referring to itself as a law enforcement agency. To be clear, the SEC is not a law enforcement agency. Nowhere in its history, in its legislative history, is it denominated a, a, a law enforcement agency. It is a civil regulator that has responsibility for the capital markets, and it has civil authority to police through civil enforcement. What has happened is, to John's point, is culturally, that, you know, when, you when, you, when you bring to the agency, and there is good reason for it to have happened post Madoff, because there was a real dysfunctionality um, within, the, in, within the enforcement division that required sort of restructuring the, the division. But by bringing in former federal prosecutors, you're talking about people who were accustomed to putting people in jail. And that is where the parallel investigations and parallel proceedings certainly come into play. But with respect to the authority of the agency, it is a civil regulator. And we could spend an hour talking about how that needs to be uh, dialed back, but that's not for this, uh, this conference. They, they, the CFTC certainly views itself as a first mover. I think it asks, itself, it, asks, it asks itself the question of whether we're a civil regulator or a criminal regulator or second. First, it says, what is the maximum potential use of our authority and how can we use it? So for CLE, let me get this out of the way. It's the most boring thing I'll say. Um, the, uh, in my judgment, perhaps the, 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 um, the most important tool for the CFTC post Dodd-Frank is, is in Section 747 of Dodd-Frank, which essentially gives them wide authority 
to regulate various ma allegedly manipulative practices in the market. And you'll, you'll get a sense from the following elaboration of what they're allowed to go after, just how broad we're talking about. It makes it unlawful for any person to engage in, quote, any trading practice or conduct on or subject to the rules of a CFTC registered entity that A, violates bids or offers, B, demonstrates intentional or reckless disregard for the orderly execution of transactions during the closing period, or C is, and I love this, is or is of the character of or is commonly known to the trade as spoofing. And spoofing is one of the things we'll talk about now. I mean, I've, that's one of my least favorite provisions of US criminal law because it strikes me as um, just making a hash of what it means to criminalize behavior. So we have all these wonderful doctrines in criminal law like the rule of lenity that you know, give defendants the benefit of the doubt in the case of vagueness of a statute that the vagueness of the statute will not be interpreted against the interest of the defendant. It's just a presumption. It's an old uh, safeguard of liberty in the United States. And this this provision cannot be squared, I would argue, with, with a rule of lenity. This, this provision is designed on its face to criminalize or to, or to regulate things that it doesn't purport to even attempt to define. It's what the, wh whatever the market says spoofing is, or what's commonly understood as spoofing, or you know, what, whatever you think spoofing might be, which of course winds up meaning whatever we think spoofing is, whatever we can persuade a court to agree with us that spoofing is. So, what is spoofing? Um, well, that's kind of the million dollar question, right? Uh, but I, I'm going to focus on it because I think it's a good lens for considering the CFTC. There are all sorts of trading practices that they don't like. But spoofing is, in a nutshell, placing an order that you don't have the intent to consummate. I think if a CFTC lawyer were here, that's what he or she would say. If you're a trader and either by using an algorithm, like a computer program that sorts bids and offers, right? or whether you're doing it on a point and click basis, that is you, a human, an autonomous trader with a mouse, right? A, 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 a dude with a mouse, right? Is sitting there like executing or placing trades. The CFTC would say, if you don't have the intent to consummate that trade, we're gonna call that spoofing. Why? Because if you place the bid or the offer, you may be warping the market, right? You, you're probably saying that you're willing to buy or sell at a price. And if you're not really willing to buy or sell at that price, you're going to move the market because other people will think that's the market price. And maybe you're doing it because you really have a secret offsetting trade that you're about to make nanoseconds later. Or maybe you're going to withdraw like, and leave people high and dry. The trouble is people place, traditionally have placed, bids and offers that they don't intend to fill, that maybe they're using permissibly just to test where the market is. And there's a, a, just a huge amount of play, I would argue, in the regulatory joints here. So um, that is sort of a, 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 you know, sort of category A of the targets for the CFTC, both traders that rely on programs and autonomous traders, as well as broker dealers and gatekeepers. I think there's a there's a quote there from Commissioner Stein at the SEC, um, making a point that if you were sitting in this room for the last presentation, you would have heard there are gatekeepers, lawyers, accountants, auditors. Um, and I think the, the civil, these civil regulators are of the view that those folks shouldn't consider themselves off the hook either. If you're auditing the books of these companies, if you're a you know, internal controls officer, or a compliance officer at a broker, dealer, or trader, you should be aware that the CFTC is on the lookout for market manipulation of the kind that, you know, in its view, constitutes spoofing, for example. Anything you want to add on this one, Jim? With respect to the SEC or with the CFTC? With anybody, yeah. Okay, yeah, I do, I do want to t talk a little bit about the SEC and its enforcement agenda because I do think it's very relevant in the international context and with respect to, uh, with respect to market rigging and capital markets. Uh, the, although the SEC does not say so per se, the SEC does have offshore activity as a priority. I mean, the institutional view at the SEC is offshore activity particularly in the small cap market and mid cap market and alternative offerings market is designed to circumvent regulation. That's really the mindset at the SEC. And if you, if you sort of think from that lens, you can, under, you can uh, get a sense for the SEC's initiatives. I'm not going to talk about 
cases because we have too much ground to cover. But if you look at the cases that the SEC has brought over the last few years, I think they're illustrative because in 2013, the SEC brought the case involving Gibraltar Global Securities and Warren Davis um, for participating in, in, in an illegal unregistered offering and sale of over 10 million shares of a microcap issuer. In 2014, it brought a case against Julian Brown and Alliance Investment Management. If you want sites to these cases, happy to happy to give them to you. That one invi involved the <coughs> Nikolai Batu matter, um, whose assets the SEC had frozen in 2012. You have what I what I refer to as the Belize cases. I'm actually involved in that in that because I, I in that matter I represent. I'm not going to talk about it in in any detail. Where I represent a one of the Belize brokerage firms and its owner and one of its uh, senior traders. But in the Belize cases, the SEC filed cases against individuals, the Phil Kieber case in July 2015, uh, the, the related Department of Justice case is known as the, the Banfield case. This involves the formation of IBCs. Uh, we're going to talk about investigative techniques in a few moments, so there are a couple things I'll come back to there. Uh, the SEC brought a case against Oppenheimer against the broker-dealer, which, which it settled. Um, and that involved, uh, that inv and there was a parallel action by the Treasury Department's uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Center. And there you had ignoring red flags relating to Gibraltar Global Securities, relating to uh, funds transfers um, and uh, suspicious activity reporting, as well as ignoring red flags with respect to individuals um, who were uh, trading billions of shares of penny stocks that were domiciled primarily offshore. It'll be discussed, I think, tomorrow, the Caledonian Bank case. You know, the SEC brought that case in February of two, 2015. In 2015, it brought a case against Israeli-based promoters, another case I can't talk about because I'm involved in, but that one involves alleging um, hacking into financial institutions to obtain, e obtain email addresses and goes into, into Bitcoin. In August of 2015, it brought a case against 32 individuals, many from many who, who were Ukrainians living in the Ukraine or from the Ukrainian committee, community for hacking to obtain news releases and engaging in insider trading. So there's a real view from the, from the SEC looking beyond. But to John's point, the reference on reference to, to gatekeepers, the SEC has a particular interest in pursuing gatekeepers because the SEC's view, SEC's view is, that, is that when when gatekeepers fall down on the job or commit violations, the investors are losing their first line of defense. That's the SEC's mindset. So the types of cases they brought against gatekeepers, they brought cases against auditors and audit firms uh, for failure to co failing to comply with auditing standards. They brought a case against BDO Seedman. They brought a case against Grant Thornton. If there's time later and you're interested, I can go into what those cases were about. They brought cases against lawyers. Um, the SEC expects a minimum level of competency in providing legal advice. They're not looking to second guess good faith eff efforts to comply but they will not hesitate to bring cases where they feel lawyers have been deficient. And to the extent that we're talking about criminal cases, we're also seeing criminal cases against lawyers. There's a case in the Eastern District of New York against Daryl Offsink, who was, a, who was very active in the, uh, who was very active in the, uh, in the small cap space with, with offerings. And you know, I've got a client who's testifying next week in a criminal case in Boston, uh, the Richard Weed case. Uh, which was a, was was a stock manipulation where the lawyer was accused of helping to conceal ownership that affected various transactions at the company. The, you know, among the gatekeepers, the SEC is interested in corporate directors. The SEC has brought cases against compliance officers, and I'll share with you a comment that the SEC's director of enforcement made publicly. And I will say, with respect to compliance officers, rarely, yeah, and I, and I don't want to spend time on this, but. For the SEC to bring an action, it's not just you know a, an attorney in the, in the trial unit signs you know signs a pleading and files it. As with the CFTC, there's a requirement of getting approval from the SEC itself, the five commissioners, to authorize an action. When it came to the cases or two cases in particular against compliance officers, SEC Commissioner Dan Gallagher actually dissented and dissented publicly. But the director, SEC's director of enforcement, said publicly, "I'll share this with you." We look hard at the facts and fairness concerns in each case. The overwhelming majority of the cases we bring involving C we bring involve CCOs who crossed a clear line 
by engaging in affirmative misconduct or obstructing regulators or who wore multiple hats. There has been no change in our longstanding careful and measured approach to determine whether we should charge a CCO. So the SEC brings cases against CCOs when they are directly involved in fraudulent activity or other conduct that harms investors. The SEC also has brought cases in the, in the, in the gatekeeper area against underwriters, brought a case against Macquarie Capital, which is a subsidiary of the international uh, Macquarie. Uh, it brought cases against broker-dealers, and we'll also bring cases um, against others who may serve in a, in a gatekeeper role. Um, I think it's also interesting the type, uh, the type of remedies that the SEC has pursued against gate gatekeepers, which I just want to touch on, because they will go beyond normal injunctions. If you think about what the SEC typically does, and again, this may end up being a template for the CFTC, and that is, if you think about what the SEC typically does, it obtains an injunction, gets a prohibition against violating a certain type of law going forward, and usually takes a monetary penalty. Here, when you're talking about gatekeepers, for lawyers and auditors, they will actually ban them from practicing in front of the SEC. With audit firms, they have imposed prohibitions on taking on new business. With law firms, they've restricted the, what type of legal services the law firm can, can, can provide. They've required independent consultants. We're not talking about monitors on this panel, but we could, but it's the same as corporate monitors. Uh, they've imposed training requirements. An example of that is the BDO Seedman case. And they've required structural changes. Think back to what I said a moment ago about chief compliance officers who wear multiple hats. What they've required is separating those. In terms of where the SEC's initiatives continue to be, they're micro cap, because again, we're trying to stay focused on international. You're not going to hear me talk about insider trading at all. Um, the micro cap task force is active. They're, where they're focusing on transfer agents, promoters, offshore broker dealers and auditors um, and the cases you know in, in both the Offsing case as well as the weed case both the two criminal cases and a lot of the other SEC cases have involved attorney opinion letters uh, so again to the extent that you're advising companies or you're seeing small cap um, issuer transactions know that opinion letters attorney opinion letters are a real issue particularly the due diligence that's underlying the issuance of those letters and for audit firms with respect to the micro cap task force their interest is in uh, substandard audits and, and audits and failing to follow auditing standards the SEC is interested in cyber security um, and I trust that the CFTC is as well what there, there are really three areas in particular. I'm not going to go into the regulations. One is cases where a registrant fails to safeguard confidential information. So for the SEC, it's an issue of protecting uh, customer information. Uh, another area of cybersecurity is where material non-public information is stolen for personal market advantage, such as some of the cases I, I, I alluded to, and also cyber-related disclosure failures. Um, I'm actually speaking at a conference on Wednesday where the focus, you know, where, where the focus is emerging, emerging markets and 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 and, uh, and small and smaller companies. And there we're going to be talking about Regulation A, Regulation A plus, crowdfunding. Those are terms that, if you're not familiar with them, you at least will hear. But know that that is an area that is of great interest to the SEC. You know, anytime there's a new method of offering and issuing securities, um, the SEC you know, tends to recognize that there is the potential, you know, there is the potential for fraud and risk, and that is a focus not only of the SEC, even though there have not been any cases yet, but FINRA is actually the, uh, the, the, the regulator of brokers um, in the United States is actually going to be paying close attention to all of the Regulation A and Regulation A plus um, offerings. And you know, I'll finish on with respect to that, with respect to FINRA, and that is we often lose sight, for example, of some of these self-regulatory uh, organizations. We, we tend to work with the corporations, but to the extent that you're working with, bro with, with brokers, FINRA is looking at all market activity. So even though FINRA does not have jurisdiction over the issuer of securities, it, 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 what it does is it will, number one, it will make inquiries, and then you can get into the whole issue of whether there is or isn't an obligation to respond. Um, but they'll, they'll make inquiries to issuers about press releases, corporate developments, and transactions. But more importantly, it will monitor trading. And FINRA refers its findings 
to the SEC for enforcement investigations and, um, and, and, and potentially for ca cases. We've talked about the Department of Justice. Know that the Department of Justice in this area is particularly active in manipulation and disclosure cases and using the off-sync and Rick Weed cases. Um, they're taking a heightened interest in the gatekeepers themselves and soon we'll talk about investigative techniques. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think we've covered uh, a lot of what they're interested in. The question is how, how, to, how do they come after what they're interested in. So transitioning over to investigative techniques, that's, that's a good old fashioned subpoena, uh, which um, you know, I think many people in the room have seen, um, for better and worse. And that is sort of the classic uh, you know, first volley that you might get. There are also agency referrals. We mentioned FINRA uh, and CME, generally speaking, the um, sort of uh, trading uh, groups uh, reporting to the CFTC, to the SEC about patterns in trading that they find suspicious. Um, there, there is quite a bit of cyber monitoring. There's, there's, there are new and interesting technologies that um, various regulators use to track movement in a, a stock uh, or in a commodity. Um, I, I think what I want to focus on on this slide is whistleblowers, because that, that's a big change um, in the last five years or so. Um, first, I mean, I think the SEC led the charge in terms of the SEC whistleblower program. On the CFTC side, from just one year, from 2013 to 2014, there were 58 whistleblower tips in 2013 and 138 in 2014. Um, the CFTC has earmarked, in my judgment, a staggering $268 million in its budget next year for whistleblower rewards. So you don't do that as a federal agency unless you expect um, for that to be a meaningful component of, of how it is you're going to be getting information. Um, smart and if I mean, with respect yes, to whistleblowers, um, in 2015, the SEC paid $37 million to whistleblowers since 2011 when the SEC uh, post Dodd-Frank actually had its, had its whistleblower uh, pr program effective. They paid more than $54 million to, to whistleblowers. $30 million was the largest payment the SEC has made to a whistleblower, and that was to a whistleblower in a foreign country. The SEC has made payments to whistleblowers in 61 countries, and the most common case referred by whistleblowers is disclosure. I do think, just with, if you go back to the, other, to the previous slide just for one moment, um, I think there are two other, uh, two other points. Don't underestimate the importance of undercover operations because with respect to you know, the, the increase of criminal investigative activities and the, and the sentencing guidelines that govern individual conduct, it's very common for, uh, for people to be wired up to get themselves better deals going forward because in the old days we used to look at cases based on the allegations. Now everything is reverse engineered from the federal sentencing guidelines and in fact the uh, the Belize case uh, that, I re that I referenced is one that involved an undercover uh, in a, in a, in a, an undercover um, FBI agent making contacts into into Belize. Another and the other point, just one other real quick point, and that is you know often people people whom we you may be advising, particularly if you're outside the United States, and they have no wind of an investigation, are thinking no big deal. You know, one of the things we've seen the SEC, you know, the, the Department of Justice use with some, with, with some regularity over the, over the last couple of years, particularly in securities cases, are sealed indictments. So what happens is someone passes through the United States, they land at the airport, and next thing, handcuffs are put on them. I go back to the Belize case. Bob Banfield was a you know, U.S. and Belize citizen, travels through Miami, gets arrested. A uh, superseding indictment in that case, um, w w there, drawing a momentary blank, uh, somebody was traveling from Canada through Arizona, or, you know, taken off the plane and arrested. It is a much more common tactic, and, what the, and for, as a result, you see many more people who are fearing U.S. government uh, view of their activities entirely staying out of the United States. So those were just a couple of additional points. And as far as agency referrals, one I'll add that does fit in is the PCAOB, which is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board as well. Anybody, anybody working on a case or been exposed to a whistleblower or an undercover source of information to the government? Surprise, perhaps? It's funny. Sometimes I'll, um, in the last couple of years, I've had a few instances where the call will come in from Brazil or Argentina or Chile, and there'll be a little sort of 
t sort of tinge of guilt in the in the in the lawyer's voice, and he or she will say, "My client so and so is going to Disney World with his grandchildren." Um, about five years ago, he received a subpoena that looks like the one on screen from the SEC. He complied with it. He answered all the questions, and they never got back to him. They never said anything to him. Should he be worried about being arrested if he goes to Disney World? Um, and so there's really no good answer, unfortunately. It's like, you know, when, when was that? What, what did they allege? Do you know what it was about? I'm trying to figure out what the statute of limitations is. The last thing you want is this guy getting off the plane in Orlando, and you know everyone's like ready to go see Mickey Mouse, and they're flexicuffs on on Grandpa's arms. Um, the, the other thing, we, John and I talked about this a little bit, but it, it might be worth you know, it might be worth you know one minute, which is for those of you who were listening to the panel or attended the panel immediately before lunch. One of the I think one of the last comments that was made was that you know that um, it does matter where you register a whistleblower complaint. Um, I, I, after talking to the person who made it, I think what he meant was not, you know, not in terms of the agency, but in terms of whether, for example, to make a whistleblower complaint to the FBI as opposed to the Department of Justice. But I'm of the view, and I think you share the view generally, that, you know, that it actually does not matter. What really does matter is a thorough assessment of the facts that you're dealing with, and where can you best position your client? You know, because because a whistleblower referral needs to contemplate not just the value of the information, but that person's participation in the activity and what are the potential consequences of making a disclosure. Uh, I do think that the information, if brought into an agency. We'll get to the right agency, but most in, in this room who are dealing with that are likely to be able to select an agency. But in terms of a generic statement that it does matter, I would disagree. It's really more about an assessment of the facts before making a, a, thoroughly before making a whistleblower complaint. Agreed. Um, so uh, the next part of our discussion just transitions a little bit into what, in our experience, is the focus of uh, CFTC, SEC, and I told you earlier that I was going to focus on spoofing as a form of market manipul manipulation. Also, the manipulation or alleged man manipulation of foreign exchange has been pretty significant in terms of the fines collected uh, by CFTC, SEC in the last few years. Um, so just a word on spoofing, just because I, I think um, it's cool to know. Uh, if, if you leave with a sort of a bare bones understanding of uh, where this is, you'll sound smart at cocktail parties, I believe, because it's, it's, it's frequently misunderstood or um, even on the regulatory level still being defined. It's, it's this practice of placing trades you don't intend to close, usually with the intent to manipulate the market. Now, that's probably a more um, robust definition than the CFTC would want. They probably want it broader. They want to know what's common in the trade as spoofing. Um, is it in the character of spoofing, whatever the heck that means? It's almost like a platonic, is it the platonic ideal of spoofing? Um, and they've almost had sort of a you know it when you see it approach to, to spoofing, which is, hey, don't tell me it's not spoofing if this guy has set up an algorithm that is programmed to withdraw a trade 48 nanoseconds after, its play, after the first counterparty on the other side withdraws. That sounds like spoofing to me. Well, maybe, but it, you know, it could be all sorts of stuff. Um, and we find that they're just sort of cutting their, their regulatory teeth on this. Um, the, 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 foreign, the forex manipulation case, cases are, are at this point a little bit more familiar than spoofing. I think that's been sort of uh, covered quite a bit in the press and uh, much to the chagrin of Citi and, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and a few other banks, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the precedent there is sort of established not by court order necessarily, but by gigantic settlement payments. So those are sort of the two key areas that I want to focus on. Yes. Who would handle the libel allegations? Yeah. So that that is um, it's funny. Um, cross border cooperation is uh, is is the answer to your question. You you'd get the serious frauds office involved, uh, SEC, CFTC. It's almost like a line of regulators at the trough on LIBOR. Um, and 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 I think the, the sort of next phase is private plaintiffs. You you'll see um, affected counterparties wanting to. Uh, sort of wet their beak as well, Jacob. What would you say? I, I would agree, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, I, and I and I think that goes back to what we were talking before about parallel investigations and parallel proceedings, and the the real unprecedented level of cooperation. I, mean, I don't think there are any there's anybody from the government who is in this room 
Um, and I'm not saying going to say something that's critical of the government if there is, but I think there's always a mindset in the U.S. that for U.S. enforcement pur purposes, and this is something I was critical of when I was at the SEC, is that the U.S. needs your information from around the world. When it comes to the time for the U.S. to help reciprocally, it's sort of like, yeah, we'll get around to it when it's convenient for us. Our cases are more important because we're the world's, you know, we're the world's policemen. You know, that's that's sort of the mindset. As a practical, uh, you know, as a practical matter, we are seeing many more cases and and a much greater initiative. A lot, a lot of that is driven by the OECD emphasis on anti-corruption. You mentioned FCPA before. We're not talking about FCPA because that doesn't fit into, you know, into market, you know, into market manipulation and, and market rigging and, and capital markets uh, per se. But I think given what we're seeing, particularly in the FCPA area, in which I do practice a fair amount, that, that we're seeing many more proceedings in multiple jurisdictions and multiple jurisdiction settlements at the same time. And I think you're getting an increased level of trust. And you know the folks with whom I've talked, both at DOJ who were in the FCPA unit and the folks at the SEC's FCPA unit, you know, you know, have to, you know, very often you can't get a hold of them because they're overseas meeting with some regulator. So there really is that much more close cooperation. Absolutely. Here's a case in point. Um, Michael Kashia uh, was the subject of a CFTC action. Parallel to it, he was subject to an investigation of the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK um, that resulted in a, a, almost about a million dollar penalty on that side. On the CFTC side, the allegation was that Panther and, and Mr. Kashia used a, an algorithm that sort of conformed to the worst case scenario I was sort of sketching for you. And they, they focused on his sort of repeated practice of um, small sell orders uh, at or near the best price, and then immediately thereafter a large buy order. So it was it was like, you know, sort of the allegation was pump up the market a little bit, and then and then quickly move in the opposite direction. Um, they settled. Mr. Uh, both Panther and Panther and Kosha settled their case with the CFTC, uh, and also settled the case uh, with uh, the FCA. But it isn't over. Um, sort of uh, a, as an illustration of um, how. You know, this can happen cross-border and in parallel. There was a criminal case. He was indicted uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. Footnote, that U.S. Attorney's Office is becoming much more aggressive in the prosecution of financial crimes, especially in the commodity space. Um, I, I think that they're, they view themselves as um, at that table with the SDNY and the EDNY um, in terms of going after financial wrongdoing. And we've seen an uptick in, in activity in, in, from that U.S. Attorney's offices. Yes. So, um, in the UK, there's a little bit of a perception that um, when you have these parallel proceedings, the, the FCA might take a bit of a back seat and let the US authorities run with something aggressively and then possibly glide on the coattails of that a little bit. And I, I know the US authorities, at least in the UK, are seen as being much more aggressive, getting you know, huge, bigger settlements and all of that. Is that consistent with your experience, or is that just a well, we're on South Beach, so I'll use a dancing analogy. I think um, I think a, a, it kind of depends on the tune, who's going to take the lead. Um, you know, I, I, I would be a very bad person to take the lead in a merengue, um, but, but uh, there are some other tunes where I might try to take the lead. <laughs> and I think that uh, Brazil is a great case in point where um, the Brazilian authorities, when it comes to Lava Jato, right, or when it comes to the Petrobras scandal or um, things that lead up to in, in sort of the current environment all the way up to the presidency. Um, those are all potentially FCPA violations, right? I mean, FCPA is just dripping from Lava Jato. But you're not seeing the fraud section in DC take the lead there, probably because it's a samba, and they want to let the Brazilians take the lead in that dance, right? I mean, it, it could be deeply destabilizing. Um, whereas sort of an amazing case in point, as, as sort of a, a counterpoint, right next door in Argentina, um, and indeed, in some ways, the tentacles go into Brazil. You've got FIFA, right? Uh, and in that case, DOJ wasn't going to wait for the Argentine authorities or the Brazilian authorities to go after, you know, global corruption in football as they perceived it. And you might think, well, wait a minute. They're talking about Argentine corruption. They're talking about Brazilian corruption. They're talking about, you know, uh, corruption in Mexico or in, in the Middle East. Why not let those authorities take the lead there? And it's very much your point about how, well, you know, we are the U.S., we're going to be muscular. So I guess it depends a little bit on the context. It also, it also depends on the country, because I was in a meeting 
um, about a year ago with the head of the SFO. It was a it was semi-public, more of a private meeting in Washington. And one of the things he was talking about was the fact that you know a lot of the a lot of these issues have been resource driven as well. And that is because the the US has such resources available to actually bring its cases, historically there has been a lot of deference. Now that, you know, that for example, UK authorities have actually designated you know, prosecutors and investigators with particularized expertise and are giving them training, I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift. And with that dialogue, to John's points, you know, you know, no question, you know, Petrobras is a, is, a, is a great example. You know, FIFA, you know, being a political hot potato, you know, it's something that U.S. prosecutors could care less about. So it's an easy one for there to be complete deference. But I really think a lot of it depends on what is the country, what are the resources available. And again, it's in the U.S.'s interest for other countries to play a prominent role, particularly in anti-corruption. Because if it's only the U.S., then there will still be that sense of, I can get away with it and fill in the blank for the jurisdiction. So the U.S. really is trying to encourage more and more either, either complementary cases where the cases are brought at the same time by the other jurisdiction, or for example, with, you know, with the UK and other authorities, for those authorities to take the lead. Come on in. Join, so, so join the enforcement party. That's right. Um, so this one's on appeal to the Seventh Circuit. Um, let me quickly go through another one that some folks may have read of. Uh, Navinder Sarau, who's um, uh, alleged of having played a substantial role in contributing to the flash crash in 2010, uh, in S&P derivatives. Uh, that one uh, sort of, uh, again, illustrates Chicago as, as an aggressive U.S. Attorney's Office. Again, it was sort of hand-in-hand -hand undertaken with the CFTC, so it's another one of these parallel enforcement actions. Uh, and uh, it hasn't really uh, progressed because he is resisting extradition to the United States. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting one. This, if I may, just yes. one point. Yep. You know, for those of you who, pra who either who really have an international practice or practice outside the United States, you know, the, the, this concept, this notion of resisting extradition or the need to actually defer to the United States is really something that need, that if, if you're a lawyer or you're in a position of counseling is something that really needs to be considered. And I'll go back to the example of the Belize case because I am now going to share with you what is in the public domain, and that is that we now have had two different uh, two different uh, judges in Belize um, who have ruled that the search that was conducted by the Belize authorities on behalf of the United States was unconstitutional or was constitutionally defective in many ways. So that while we often think of the extradition analysis and the need to respond to the United States as being focused entirely on the United States, I mean, this goes back to the whole concept of, you know, other, you know country, uh, countries other than the United States, other than the United States, have a rule of law, have courts, and that many of those courts will respect their, the constitutional rights of their own citizens, of their corporations, regardless of what may appear in a mutual legal assistance treaty or what may be a request by the United States Department of Justice. And by, by simply rolling over at an early stage and saying yes to extradition or not considering um, exercising all rights that may be available under the laws of that, of that other jurisdiction, I think you're actually doing a disservice to the client because you know where Bob Banfield in the Belize case was actually picked up in the United States and doesn't have that luxury, you know, the interesting question will be whether the United States District Court judge in the Eastern District of New York now will somehow give weight to the fact that there's now a judge in Belize who has publicly opined that the entire search was, un was unconstitutional and there was no right to the information. And the other, in, in the other opinion, the one that relates to my clients in Belize, the issue there was the court, you know, the court issued what I'll call a thoughtful ruling, I wasn't entirely pleased with it, but basically said, that which was the subject of the search relating to these clients and their customers in the United States was appropriate. 
or at least you know, warranted some further discussion. But with respect to just coming in and seizing everything and shipping everything off to the United States, that violated the rights of all those other customers and clients who are in doing business in Belize. So it's important to, to, uh, to make sure that all of the rights that exist under local law, non-US law, are exhausted in any legal process. Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, so, and again, fortunately, my clients are, fi are fighting extradition, so I've yet to have to deal with this with the U.S. courts. But I would expect that Bob Banfield's lawyer is now going to argue, I'm guessing, but I'm guessing that he's going to argue that now that a Belize court has ruled that we're talking about everything being unconstitutional, meaning that the search was illegal, that should be impermissible for use. Now, if we're talking about this next year, I will tell you I've got some ideas that, I'm, that I've been sharing with the Belize lawyers as to what I think should be the next steps. But the point is, I'm trying to exhaust creativity in Belize, not in the United States, because most courts are going to say exactly what the Australian court said, which is, we don't care, it's here now, we're going to use it, which is why you want to be exhaustive in the, in the home court of jurisdiction. One, one way this has traditionally come up is an application what's, of what's called the rule of specialty. Folks who practice in this area will be familiar with that. But in, in broad outline, the concept is if I'm a court in Italy and I'm extraditing an Italian citizen to the United States, in my order, I will state the crimes that the person is being extradited to face. And those crimes alone are the crimes that that person is permitted to face in this other country. So for example, if you're extradited from Italy to the United States to face a wire fraud charge, and the US Attorney's Office develops reason to believe that they want to supersede the indictment and charge you with tax fraud too, you may have a rule of specialty problem, and that person may have the ability to resist extradition. So one way in which this family of questions has traditionally come up is, is in the um, is in that context. So if you're ever trying to figure out what a, a, a sovereign is going to do, the rule of specialty is a good place to start in, in your research. Um, another uh, interesting wrinkle um, in, in, um, in extradition, um, in, in, my, in my experience, is you know, it's, um, it, it can take a long time. Uh, and in many countries, there are all sorts of formal and informal um, limitations on how long an action can be pending or how old a defendant can be. Brazil is like an amazing case in point here. As, as, as a reality, if you're over the age of 65 in Brazil and you're convicted of just about any crime, you're probably not going to go to jail. You know, you may be sentenced and convicted and you may receive a sentence and a financial penalty, but as a matter of practice, they generally speaking don't sentence people over the age of 70, say, to jail which is not a problem for folks here in the United States, uh, but is for a lot of folks in Brazil to sort of take a second look at whether to fight extradition and to mount a specialty-like argument that says, well, in Brazil, I could not be held accountable for this crime, so why should I be held, held accountable in the United States? Which goes back to the concept of using the law of the home jurisdiction to narrow a case as much as possible, or in essence, create a scenario where ultimately you're hoping that the courts in dealing with the other constitutional issues or how the case has been li li litigated collaterally, even without getting to, to, um, to extradition, ultimately can, can inure to the benefit of the extradition proceeding. So just to try and wrap things up a little uh, quickly, let me just share with you something happening in real time. A few of my partners are uh, in the middle of arguing this case in Chicago. Uh, it involves a, uh, it's a CFTC filed suit against a, a trader named Igor, Igor Oystocker. Um, his firm, 3Red, is accused to have been engaged in spoofing. In this case, the CFTC is relying on what I referred to earlier as the commonly known in the trade prong of the test. So they're saying that most folks in the trade understood this practice, this, I won't bore you with the specific practice, um, to constitute spoofing. The fascinating thing here is the CFTC has not promulgated regulations on what this means. They have sued first before passing regulations on what this practice means. And in, in our experience, this is becoming the new normal. Last year, we represented a wholesaler of precious metals that was, again, sued by the CFTC 
before the CFTC had articulated guidance on what would and would not constitute a violation of the relevant provision of Dodd-Frank that was at the heart of that case. It has a sort of shoot first, ask questions later approach to it. And I fear that this is the new normal because of the titanic size of Dodd-Frank as a piece of legislation. There's no legislative history on what spoofing means. Think about that for a minute. There was no debate in Congress about what this provision of Dodd-Frank should mean. It was just passed. And you have an agency that is willing to sue you for a violation of something that Congress didn't debate, Congress didn't define, Congress didn't discuss what it should or shouldn't be mean, and the, the agency itself hasn't done, say, a cost-benefit analysis, hasn't promulgated regulations to clarify what's out of bounds and what's in bounds. They're going to sue you now. And they're going to let the court decide what the boundaries are. It's a gamble from a regulatory perspective, one, one we think will be very interesting to And watch. the legislator who co-introduced Dodd-Frank, Barney Frank, admitted that he did not even read the entirety of his own piece of legislation. So in conclusion, from my perspective, there are a few things that you can take away if you advise clients in this space um, and are, are um, you know, want to be mindful of the risk of US regulatory attention for trading practices. And the first is to, to be aware of the different platforms across which people communicate, whether it's Bloomberg chat or text messages or uh, all sorts of proprietary communication softwares that people assure you, like they assure us at our firm, they vanish, don't worry, it's like Snapchat, it goes away. Um, be aware, because the, um, the regulators are aware of those technologies too, uh, and may someday want you to reproduce a Bloomberg chat, a text message, and you should be in a position to advise your clients that they may someday be called upon to produce those things. An another unfortunate lesson, I think, of the last few years of CFTC and SEC enforcement is that you can take very little comfort in the passage of time. We see a lot of cases that federal civil regulators bring right up against the statute of limitations, right up against you know, that, that five, 10 year horizon because they say they're overburdened, because they don't have the bandwidth to get to things. And um, that's, that's, from my perspective, just an unfortunate reality of, uh, of these cases. And the SEC will ask for tolling agreements. That is a written agreement to cause the statute of limitations to be pushed to a further date. And it, you know, it really does create a dilemma for the lawyer who you want to say, no, you're up on the clock, to which their answer is, well, then we'll just bring a case you know, prematurely because obviously the reputational harm from bringing a case far outweighs the value in agreeing to a tolling agreement. So the mere fact that you're taking comfort in the passage of time does not mean that there isn't a solution that has now become somewhat abused, particularly at the SEC. We talked a little bit about whistleblower complaints. Don't be surprised by competitor complaints, too. Uh, we have found that the CFTC and SEC frequently rely on bad stuff your competitors have to say about you to initiate an action, which is, of course, a very biased source of intelligence, one would think about why a law enforcement agency or a civil regulator should rain fire upon your house. Uh, but, but the truth is, sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes it, it's enough to open a file at the very least, uh, to start sending subpoenas, uh, to start doing some uh, third party, you know, subpoenas to third parties to gather intelligence. And then the next thing you know, you have a regulatory problem. And we talk about competitor complaints. I mean, at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about what the agency's enforcement priorities were. And I think in talking about, for example, where the SEC's priorities were, and we referenced, for example, the type of cases and their interest in gatekeepers. Obviously, that implicates the whole, the whole concept of, you know, of compliance. But when we're talking about um, don't be surprised by competitor complaints, I would also encourage you to be sensitive to actions against competitors. Because from a compliance perspective, you know, a best practice in my view is in using, and the FCPA is the best example. <clears throat> and that is, if you have clients who have business activities in Africa, in a, in a particular industry segment, if the, if the Justice Department has just brought a case involving, you know, involving a, a corporation in that industry sector in that country, you should be familiar with that case and you should be asking your client, 
do you have any similar problems? Because there will be an expectation when you are negotiating or talking to the agency that, what do you mean? You're, you didn't, you're not aware of this case that we brought showing that we care about this? Because typically in those cases, you're going to get cooperation. We're, we see that domino effect of cooperation. And if there's no further cooperation to be had within a company, and we have not talked about the Yates memo, which is the deputy, the uh, deputy attorney general. She, she did the DAG, yeah, the DAG, the uh, deputy attorney general's uh, memo regarding the imperative at the Justice Department now of prosecuting individuals, regardless of what the deal is that has been resolved with the corporation. The fact is, where do you go next? You go to the competitors. Yeah, you got us, but you know what they're doing. So it's important to pay attention from a compliance perspective to what is going on in the marketplace so that you can then counsel your clients accordingly. I hope that's been helpful um, as guidance uh, and as uh, things that you can do proactively uh, to be prepared. Um, if, if you have questions or if you want to uh, continue our discussion, this is probably a good, a good point at which to, for, us, you know, for, for us to stop and entertain those questions. I think we've had a good dialogue. Yes. Have you had any experience testing uh, requests to pull the statute of limitations when the government seeks foreign evidence? Is this particularly a criminal case kind of a team that they have that vision? Um, you know, I have to go into too much detail, but you know, under the theory that it was done sort of as pretext to give them more time uh, on any sort of bona fide request for evidence that they have already I was on the I was on the receiving end of such a request. Um, yeah, you know, uh, prosecutors like to tell war stories. I'll tell a short one. Um, it was probably my second month at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and someone wheeled um, four boxes into my office, and I could tell as soon as they got wheeled in that the boxes were probably older than I was. Um, and I was right. Uh, the boxes were from a 1974 drug homicide in Miami, and they related to a guy who sort of the last missing defendant went to Nicaragua, decamped, gone. Uh, and uh, through an, an amazing sort of, uh, you know, only in the federal government kind of story, uh, his indictment had remained sealed, but no steps had been taken to apprehend him in Nicaragua. No red notice at Interpol, no uh, attempt to track him down. Um, he uh, becomes elderly, and by the time 30 years later, 34 years later, I guess, I'm touching the case, um, he wants to reconnect with his family and, and die in peace. And his lawyers approach us and say, um, you know, we, um, you know, he wasn't charged with murder. Um, you know, it's a, it's a narcotics case. You never tried. We're going to, we're going to move to dismiss the indictment for failure to prosecute, which is sort of related to what you're talking about. And the decision we made as an office was we're not going to dismiss the indictment proactively we are going to let you take a gamble about whether you're going to come into the United States or not. Um, and if you come and are arrested, we may or may not prosecute you. This was the position of the office. Um, I don't know what ultimately happened, and that should tell you what the office decided. I think the office sort of decided at that point to let it go. And I think most prosecutors acting in good faith, um, if you had a meritorious argument about government being asleep at the switch. I would hope and I would expect because I, you know, uh, a, a few of my partners continue to make fun of me for um, trusting in the good faith of, of government lawyers, but I still basically do. Um, and I think that, especially on the criminal side, maybe less so on the civil side, um, a truly um, uh, sort of lengthy uh, gap between the conduct um, and say an argument that, hey, this tolling agreement is garbage, it's, this is 20 years. I, but I, I would expect it to be really delayed. I think a seven year delay, say, you know, a in a five year statute of limitations situation, it's closer to the line. What would you I, say? I would say? I would say no uniformity. I think it yeah. really depends on what you're dealing with. I think the states are likely to be um, far less sympathetic. Um, but I do think you're going to get a, you know, a, I go back to the word I used at the very beginning where, where I used the word principled. Loosely, I do think you do get a, a greater sense of rationality from federal prosecutors. But I mean, I find myself negotiating free passage letters, 
you know, where I know there's a where I know there's a criminal investigation, somebody's coming in for SEC testimony. I want assurances that my person's not going to get arrested, or person's not coming in for SEC testimony. It's really that it's really that simple. The other thing to be aware of is that if you're if you're advising somebody who has been you know, who's been charged and is outside the jurisdiction, ethically you cannot counsel them to stay away. Ethically, your obligation is to counsel them to return. You know, if they choose not to follow your advice, that's a different issue. Uh, but I think there's also that need to be mindful of your ethical, you know, for lawyers, ethical obligations, and for a corporation, what is in the best interest of, of, the, of the organization. And, but I, I, and I do think one of the real issues, particularly in the FCP area, which is not really what we're talking about, but it could come into play, is the, is the notion of corporations are being expected to bring their employees to the United States to, uh, you know, in, in, in essence, to cooperate in the U.S. jurisdiction. And, all, and that's sort of viewed as a basis for whether or not, whether to credit a corporation with cooperation. You know, just as an example, totally unrelated, I represented uh, the brother of the former Prime Minister of Israel in his public corruption prosecution. All I cared about was keeping him in the United States. There was no way I was letting him get on an airplane, where the guy ultimately ended up, ended up testifying from the U.S. Attorney's Office in, you know, in, uh, in, in D.C. for the case going on in Israel. So you really, it's, it's a very case-by-case, jurisdiction-by-jurisdiction specific analysis. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all very much for your attention. I really enjoyed this conversation. Hope you did too. Thank you.